Greetings Alliance Northwest family. I am really grateful for another opportunity to drop into your world for a handful of minutes to check in with you. And uh, I just want to be honest with you. As I uh, as I come to you this month, I'm I'm just feeling some weight. I'm feeling some heaviness uh, as I've been praying for you and talking with so many of you again over this last month. I mean, we're Heading into August, summer has been cruising. There's been some uh, lessening of restrictions on masks, and that's felt great. But now we're hearing there could be more, and and uh, and I know you're 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 struggling in some areas of your leadership, and you're excited in others. But I tell you, I, I think I think leading in this current moment, leading in this moment for most leaders has been marked less by joy and more by weariness perhaps more than ever in ministry I, i'm i'm just sensing that you're you're weary you're tired there's been disunity in the churches discouragement in the churches hypercritical people people not coming back people leaving to go to another church uh, the whole digital uh, uh extension of your church is how are we connecting it's, it's it's been a wearying year. But there was a quote I read in a book I'll talk about in a moment. There was a quote in this book. Uh, this book was quoting from a, a Henry Blackaby book called Fresh Encounters. And a Christian leader in China made this uh, observation. He said that Christians in China are praying for our Christian brothers and sisters in America. We believe we are handling our persecution better than you are handling your prosperity. That hit me. We believe we are handling our persecution better than you are handling your prosperity. That that really got my head spinning and thinking. It's like, so how have we been handling our prosperity? Has that potentially been a part of why we have experienced such a wearying year when a, a pandemic that hits us like COVID potentially could have launched us into some of the most fruitful months and years uh, in our ministry, yet it has worn us out and we've seen decrease or decline. So I started thinking about that. In our prosperity, it has over the decades definitely created more options for Americans. We we have been blessed with prosperity in this country, and that has given us more options, more more tech options. You can visit any church you want. Um, more travel options. You can go anywhere you want, and often families are, and they're not showing up at church. It's created more opportunities for uh, many families have bought vacation homes, so they're spending their weekends at the lake. So our prosperity could have led towards greater generosity, but has it actually created a higher level of consumerism? I think it has. Materialism, I think it has. And self-centeredness, and, and potentially even individualism. I'd say our prosperity has also created uh, a, a massive commodity for our kids' culture. The number of activities for kids has grown exponentially and the costs, which causes us to work harder. So while we have prospered, we have spent that prosperity in areas that have not drawn us closer to God, but have created a more of a self-centered individualistic culture. And per perhaps maybe the word I'm looking for is entitled. <laughs> the word we see the rise of the Karens, the rise of entitlement and that culture we are trying to disciple in our churches, COVID has revealed a, a shallow discipleship, hasn't it? I think that could be a portion of our weariness. I wish I had the silver bullet for you, and I really don't. What I do have, though, is the one thing that is most important for leaders who find themselves in a moment that is marked more by weariness than joy to reclaim the ancient pathway of prayer. I believe this is mission, 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 mission critical. I want to read to you from a book I would really like to encourage you to read. Jeremiah Porter, 
uh, gave me this book this year. Uh, this book has kicked my hiney in a, a very good way and I have enjoyed it. So I'll talk a little bit more about it and I wanna pull a few thoughts, but first I would just wanna to read to you uh, from it. Uh, it says, in the midst of these developments, the great strength in the American church has become its greatest weakness. Somewhere along the way, unintentionally and gradually, we moved our feet of faith away from desperate dependence on the resurrection of Christ away from the Holy Spirit as our only source of power, away from desperate times of prayer. I think our prosperity has become our power. I think our prosperity has been the very thing that has pulled us away from the ancient paths of Holy Spirit dependence, of desperate times of prayer, and focus on the resurrection of Christ. He says, we believe these things in our doctrinal statements, and that's good, but we do not believe them in our actions. Slowly, unintentionally, our feet of faith have shifted away from prayer as the only means of siphoning supernatural strength through the dimensions of the universe into our human world. We in the American church have more resources than any other church in history, that's prosperity, and as the gravity of human nature so often tends actionable faith has drifted to depend on these tangible resources, dollars, political clout, facilities, paid staff. There's nothing morally wrong with these tangible resources, but we are witnessing the principle of sowing and reaping. We have sowed to human ingenuity, strategy, and power. We have sowed through recent decades to the power of new buildings, and congressional lobbying, and we are reaping what we sowed. How do we return to sowing seeds of faith that desperately depend on God's word, his spirit, and himself? Scripture answers this question. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. <laughs> so this book definitely uh, challenging us back into a posture of prayer and, and why is prayer so important <laughs> i have been asked this as a pastor a number of times i'm sure you have too well if god doesn't always do what i ask in prayer why pray at all well you know prayer is the ultimate acknowledgement that you are not god prayer is the ultimate acknowledgement that you are not in control, that you are not sovereign, and that you cannot control your destiny or the people around you. Prayer is the ultimate act of saying, I need a higher power to involve himself in my life, to change it and to transform it. Prayer is the source of ministry. Prayer is the first work, not the last work, but it has become the last work for far too many of us. I just want to share quickly uh, with you today five, maybe five, five inspirations about prayer that I'd encourage you to, to take to heart. The first is this, is to believe, say, I, to choose to believe that without a doubt that the more praying that you do, the more God will move in your life. Do you actually believe that? Do you believe that if I pray more? God will move more. Do you believe what R.A. Torrey said, that, uh, that prayer can do anything that God can do? Uh, I want to give you a quote by Leonard Ravenhill. He says this, No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and many payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. Decide today to say, I, I choose to believe. The more I pray, the more God moves. I choose to believe that prayer can do anything that God can do. 
it can lift your weary soul. It can change your attitude. It can start to bring about seasons of joy in your life. So my second point would be to do this, and that's to determine to be devoted to conversations with God. You probably will need to change up the way you pray. There's different ways to pray. You, you can pray through scripture, meditate, chew on scripture, and then, then talk to God about what you just read. You can engage God through reading through hymns or singing hymns and then talking to him about the truths embedded in those hymns or those spiritual songs. You can do the traditional acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's the, the kindergarten level of prayer, right? But you begin to adore uh, God and confess your sin, lift up the prayers and thank God for all that he's doing. You could uh, pray for unreached people groups. You can do the A.B. Simpson way, spin that globe, baby, land your finger, and lift those people up before the throne of God. I'd encourage you to do this. I've been doing this for you. <laughs> pray constantly for your people. Pray constantly for your people. Pray for them as them. Stand in the gap for them. They may not even know how to pray. They may be so stuck. If you would pray for them as them, you stand in that gap, intercede for them before the throne. Pray for your people often. Let that ignite your soul. Four, this is my favorite, read books on prayer. But don't just read books on prayer. As you read, let them lead you into prayer. I'll pop up a little post here of some various books, but uh, a couple I wrote that of influence me is one is fresh wind fresh fire by jim cimbala uh, the valley of visions classic on puritan prayers and devotions why revival terries by leonard ravenhill anything by em bounds on prayer um the book called prayer by Oli uh Halsby. with christ in the school of prayer by andrew murray living prayer by robert benson daring to draw near by john white the Way of the Heart by Henry Nowen, Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, Keys to the Deeper Life, excellent book uh, by Tozer, and then Come Up Higher by one of our Alliance theologians, Paul King, great book. And the last one I wanted to share with you is, is, is this one. It's Old, the Old Paths, New Power. And here's, as I move towards a close with this, uh, and I have one more encouragement. Uh, this has been uh, a transformed book. This has inspired me the way Jim Cimbala's book, Fresh One, Fresh Fire, did. And uh, I would love, if you are interested in uh, doing a once-a-month check-in on Zoom with me, chapter by chapter with this book, just shoot me an email. I'll, I'll create I'll, I'll create the group. Uh, Monty, M-O-N-T-Y. Uh, Monty with a Y. Uh, Monty at AllianceNW, AllianceNorthwest.org. Just let me know. If you're interested, I'll... I'm going to create a group probably towards the end of September. Let's chew through this together. Uh, let's let it challenge and inspire us to greater dependency on the Holy Spirit in prayer. And uh, I would love to have some time with you on, on a Zoom conversation about prayer and spending some time praying. So uh, let me know. I would love to do that with you. The fifth practice is this. Listening prayer. One of the one of the most, uh, how do I even say this? One of the things that I have seen pastors do the least, which is the most important in their life, is to move into prayer, but to wait for the Lord to speak. We we dial, we talk, we hang up. Uh, we confess, we pray for these various things and various people, and we hang up. Prayer is a conversation. It's a dialogue. God is longing to meet you in your prayer closet listening prayer, to sit in the presence of God. After you've talked or had a conversation, just wait. Wait on the voice. He is speaking. He speaks in your soul. He speaks in your mind. He speaks through the word. He'll speak to you in different ways. Make a decision to, to stay in, listen, in a listening posture until you receive that shalom from the Holy Spirit to say, okay, here's your answer or this, this time is done. Move towards a posture of listening prayer. I've found probably that shift for me began probably more in my 40s than in my 20s or 30s. The listening prayer has become the mainstay, just to sit at the feet of the master, 
to wait for him to speak or just to simply absorb his presence, trusting he is sovereign, he is in control. And when I'm sitting on daddy's lap, I don't need to fear anything. And in his presence, may your soul be filled with joy and faith and hope. I love you all. Look forward to talking with you again soon.